Today's guest is Candace Sanderson. She is a trained psychologist who began to receive information from messengers from otherworldly sources. Her books, The Reluctant Messenger and The Reluctant Messenger Returns, chronicle her expedition across a vast expanse of universal consciousness that led to new truths about life that she thought she had known so well. Candace, thank you so much for joining us today. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you, Jeff. It's a real honor to be here with you. And thank you. Let's establish your background a little bit. Can you tell me your academic and professional background before we get into your experience? Yes, yes. I was trained as a psychologist. Um, I And this was in Kentucky when I lived in Kentucky. I became both a clinical psychologist and a school psychologist. When I moved to Florida about 25 years ago, I started working as a, well, I did a little bit of clinical work on the side, but most of my work was in school psychology. So I got to take all those things that I had learned as a psychologist and really apply it to a school setting. Um, I worked in, um, I worked with pre-K students I worked with the zero to two age population, which was which was great. I mean, I think the youngest child I actually tested was three months old. Wow. Um, when I retired two years ago, I was working at, at a high school. So most of my focus since I've been in Florida has been on the, that school age population, really from zero to high school. Hmm. And what a difference. Yeah, I uh, probably... As far as I know, in the recent days of of high school psychologists, unfortunately, you end up doing a lot of what they call, I don't know what they call them out in Florida, but like you meet with the teacher and the student and the parents and write reports about what's going on. Yes, yes. And when I retired a couple of years ago, that was shifting and we weren't doing as much um, consultation with teachers and parents too, as far as uh, behavior management. Mm -hmm but we started doing violent threat assessments. Wow. And that was that was new for us. We had to really start focusing on um, that real issue of school violence. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. That that's, was a big issue. Wow, that's very interesting. Um, all right, so you just said, I believe that you retired two years ago, correct? Yes, in June of 2018. To 2018. Now, you, I believe you had your experience in 2013. And if so, tell us what happened. Oh my goodness, it was it was interesting. Now, first of all, I've written two books. One, this book behind me, you'll see, uh, The Reluctant Messenger, Tales from Beyond Belief. I wrote this book and then published it two weeks after I retired. So mm -hmm. here I was thinking I was you know, going to enjoy this beautiful retirement. And two weeks later, I published this book, mm -hmm. and it did really well. I mean, it hit number one on Amazon, you know, just within a couple of days. That's amazing. But the experiences that I had started back in 2013. And being a psychologist, um, I really didn't know what to think about them. You know, my training had been steeped in the scientific method. It's like if you couldn't use your senses... Um, to hear it, taste it, see it, you know, feel it. In my world, it didn't exist. So can you imagine, here I am driving to work one morning, August 2013, and all of a sudden this message just drops into my awareness. And it's like, uh-oh, <laughs> what do we do now? Okay, can you please define for me what you mean by dropping in your awareness? Yes. Yes, I was driving to work one day, Jeff, and, mm -hmm. and I always would get to work early, you know, 30 minutes, an hour, sometimes a couple hours early. So I'm driving to work. It's, you know, it's dark out. The sun hasn't even come up yet. Mm -hmm. And I'm paying attention to my driving, but there's like no one on the road. So my car is almost on automatic pilot. Yeah. And all of a sudden, I get this message and it, it literally felt like it dropped into my awareness. And I, the language that, mm -hmm. the words that they used, I knew that this was not anything from me. It was more like a message for me. I mean, in fact, um, I thought, 
gosh, that's so pretty. I wish I had thought of it myself. I mean, I knew immediately this wasn't from me, but it came in so specific. I didn't hear it with my words. I mean, you know, like words with my ears, but I, the words were so specific. And it was a message about a flower. And it said that a flower is a flower. So you take the word flower and hyphenate it. Mm -hmm. A flower of energy. Hmm. And the message said, if a plant, you know, a plant reaches its roots down to Mother Earth, and then it ascends toward Father Sky. And when it is in this perfect alignment with Source, it then produces a blossom, a flower. And then the message went on and said, humans too are flowers. We are the flowers. And if you remain grounded and then, you know, reach toward the, the goals you want, then you're open to this beautiful potential and you will blossom. And it was, it was just, it was amazing because, you know, I didn't use terms like that. I didn't use terms like mm-hmm. Mother Earth and Father Sky mm-hmm. back then. Mm-hmm. You know, I do now. Um, and Source. I didn't use words like Source. So I knew this was not a message from me, but it was a message for me. So it's kind of like you just, all of a sudden, you just started thinking about this message. Is that how you would explain it? Like you just started saying, why did I think that? Or where did that come from? Exactly. What did? What? What is this? What, you know, where did this come from? Because I knew it wasn't from me. Now, this is when my training kicked in as a psychologist, mm-hmm. and, and all of my training. And as I mentioned before, I was mm-hmm. trained as both a clinical and a school psychologist. Mm-hmm. But my training kicked in, yeah. and my training as a psychologist said, "Look at the pathology." Yeah. So I did. You know, I looked at what's wrong. Uh-huh. What's you know what's wrong with me? Um, you know, it, I, I'm literally driving down the road. I have this message. I know it's not from me. My heart is really starting to pound because I'm thinking, what's going on? Mm-hmm. But in my head, I'm like running through the the DSM five, which mm-hmm. is the diagnostic manual, of, you know, that we use to diagnose mm-hmm. disorders. Mm-hmm. So I'm running through all the criteria for psychosis while I'm driving. And I thought, you know, I'm not psychotic. I am I am oriented to time, place and person. You know, I don't know what this is. I couldn't explain it. So I just dismissed it. And this is something that that we do all the time when we're confronted with information that's new to us Mm -hmm. uh, or information we don't really want to pay attention to. Mm -hmm. If it's if it's a novel situation, we don't we're operating in the dark. We don't have any files in our brain that say, oh, this is what this means or we should do that. So I just denied it. I just dismissed it. I thought, no. Oh, well, I, you know, I've got better things to do. I mm-hmm. need to get to work an mm-hmm. hour early. Yeah. Well, if somebody came to you as a patient and told you of this experience, how would you diagnose them? You know, um, how would I diagnose them today? Or mm-hmm. how did I diagnose them well, years ago? Years ago. Yes. Years ago, I viewed the world through the, li- through the empirical lens of science. Sure. You know, once again, if something could not be measured by your five senses, it didn't exist. So therefore, that person must be hallucinating. Mm -hmm. Yet when it happens to you, and you know that you are, you know, very grounded, Mm -hmm. then you start to kind of expand your beliefs Mm -hmm. and you think, okay, don't know what this is, but we're gonna go with it and we'll see what happens. Mm Are there really a lot of objective signs that you can sense on a person when making diagnoses? Like, like as if you were like, okay, he has, a, you know, he has a laceration there. It's two centimeters deep, and okay, that's going to need stitching. You know, that's something that's a little bit more observable. But with people with mental um, disorders, unless they're, I guess, making motions, I would say it's kind of a subtle science on making diagnoses on those type of patients as well. 
you know, it certainly can be. So what you do is you learn to step back and look at the broader picture. If someone is really hallucinating, if they are psychotic, mm -hmm. then they're usually not functioning well. You know, mm. are they able to get up and, and take care of themselves? You know, can they shower? Can they dress? Can they go to work? Can they function? Mm. Can they carry on a conversation? So when you start looking at how are they functioning in their environment, the pieces start coming together. And if you see that there are a lot of pieces missing and they're really not able to function, then you start looking more in terms of, okay, this appears to be a mental condition. Mm. Now, when I applied that same, those same criteria to myself really fast while I'm driving, mm. I realized I'm perfectly normal, whatever that is. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I know where I am. I'm oriented time, place, and person. Um, but what is this? Mm -hmm. You know, I knew it wasn't from me, but I couldn't explain what it was. But, you know, it didn't matter. I just dismissed it. Hmm. Didn't right. bother me one bit. Had you, Still, been, had you been doing anything prior to this that kind of, you know, opened you up? Or were you doing anything paranormal or do anything that could have been a catalyst to get you to do this? You know, I I had always been interested in um, in psychic types of things. Um, my mother seemed to have a lot of psychic ability. As far as myself, no, I had no psychic abilities whatsoever. Now, I did. Um, I was a student of Monroe Institute, okay. which is a, a place in outside of Charlottesville, Virginia. They use sound-based technology. And it's, it's one of the world's leading authorities on um, expanding your awareness and expanding consciousness. Hmm. What I found out later, this spontaneous opening that happened on this day ended up not being so spontaneous at all because I had just come back from, a, from the Monroe Institute. I had attended a program called Lifeline. And Lifeline is a graduate level program. Now, Monroe uses binaural beats and other sound-based technologies, um, and they'll layer these frequencies so that the listener will be taken to this realm of expanded awareness. I mean, it's lovely because, you know, I call it the lazy person's way to meditate. Mm -hmm. You don't have to meditate, you just put on the headphones. But I had been to this program called Lifeline, where we are supposed to retrieve souls, people who had newcomers, they said, people who had just passed away but hadn't quite made it to the other side. Mm. And I thought, well, I'm not too sure how to do this. Um, not too sure I really believed it, because like, what is retrieval anyway? Are you retrieving parts of yourself? I actually took this program because it was a prerequisite for another program. So mm -hmm. I really wasn't even interested in it, which is, I hate to say that, but mm -hmm. I wasn't. Yeah. But all of a sudden, um, you know, we're, we're doing the first retrieval and all of a sudden, and this is like two weeks before I get the flower message, this name drops into my awareness. I get a first and last name and then I get Topeka, Kansas, and then I get the word Jackson. Now, I had no idea what Jackson was, but I knew what it was not. I knew it was not a family name. Mm. So anyway, I'm thinking, what is this? Maybe I shouldn't believe it, you know, but you know, isn't it funny how your mind makes these things up? So after the first, you know, session, we all gather back together. And uh, I had my iPhone with me because when this message started, I just hit record on my iPhone and these words just came out. So I Googled real fast this man's name, city and state, a state I've never even been in. Um, and I typed in the word obituary. And my gosh, Jeff, there's his obituary. Mm. And I didn't even know until I was writing the book and I did more research years later that his day of passing was exactly three months to the day from when I did this retrieval on him. Mm. And somehow that being um, 
so specific, it just kind of added to the authenticity. So what was happening at this program is I was getting experience and learning how to um, maybe, I should say, navigate the realms of the non-physical. And this program changed me. I mean, after that, I had five and six people with first, middle, and last names, city and states where they were from. And they were all these newcomers who had just passed. And all of these things that I believed, I no longer believed anymore. I, I reached this tipping point and they became knowns to me. So Lifeline transformed me, mm. but I didn't recognize it, not in real time. Right. But then two weeks later, I'm driving to work and this message comes. Mm -hmm. After the message came, did you put two and two together and think, hmm, maybe this is a result from Lifeline, or you really <laughs> didn't think so? No, in fact, I didn't even put that together till years later. Hmm. You know, I have two books that are separated in time by two years, mm -hmm. but the stories behind the books are separated by more than five years. This first book tells about the how, the second book um, tells about the why it occurred. Mm -hmm. But as I'm driving to work and I get this message that I dismiss, mm -hmm. you know, Lifeline and Monroe Institute didn't even enter my mind. Mm -hmm. But there was something else that happened by, you know, I'm driving to work, I've dismissed it, I get to work, as I say, an hour early, you know, the parking lot's empty, and I, you know, park my car, gather my briefcase, and I'm walking toward the side entrance. Now, it had been dark, the sun was just starting to come up, and all of a sudden, I had this um, overwhelming feeling that I was not alone. And I remember, I mean, I just turned to my right because something was calling my attention. And then I saw it. I was Jeff, I was looking at a tree, a, a royal poinciana tree. Now, a royal poinciana has this, these, it's a, there's like this gnarly trunk and these wide spreading branches that curve upward and it makes this beautiful canopy. And the, the flowers on this tree, the subtropical tree, look like orchids. They're, they're red, orange, they're gorgeous. Mm -hmm. But I had passed this tree a hundred times, you know, it's a tree. But this time that tree called to me and I walked over and I looked at it. And this began the first really mystical experience of my life. As I looked at that tree, I realized that tree was as much alive as I was. It was a sentient being. Mm. And I mean, I was just mesmerized. The light was filtering through the leaves and on the ground, there were these beautiful patterns of light and dark. And I'm just, I'm just in awe. And all of a sudden, my focus is called to this one tiny blossom, not even a blossom, a bud that hadn't even flowered yet. And then, that message I had just received about the flower being a flower of energy came back to me. And I realized I was that bud. Hmm. I was that potential. And it's not just me. It's all of us. We are that potential that if we remain grounded and if we have, if we reach up towards source, we can be that flower of energy and we can be open to the greatest potential we've ever known. Hmm. So I'm standing there and time didn't exist. I mean, I, I mean, I'm sure I was there just a few minutes, but it could have been months. And when it was over, I, you know, I turned around and I walked in the building and, you know, I, you know, little did I know that I had just taken my first steps into the world of spirit, the, the unseen world. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it's like the first message I ignored, but I couldn't ignore this with the tree. I realized something really special had just happened. Before or after this, 
Were you or are you or did you become a religious person? I grew up in Western Kentucky. Western Kentucky is in the middle of what we call the Bible Belt. Mm -hmm. So um, we went to church every time the day, you know, the gates were open, the doors were open. Um, We read from the Bible. Once I moved to Florida, I, you know, started about 25 years ago, I started realizing that, you know, I was drawn toward more of a, to take a spiritual path. I felt like the path of religion for me was was a little bit too narrowly defined. Uh, so I became spiritual. I embraced the spirituality. Um, and th- what was happening with me fit in pretty well with spirituality. And but what I discovered later is with the more and the more and more messages that I got, the more that I realized that a lot of these beliefs that I grew up with were simply that they were beliefs. But I thought they were truths. Hmm. Um, and I, I just decided to kind of go with the flow and see what the information would bring me. When did you get your next message? The same day or did they slowly start coming more often or what happened? It, they, they, well, it, it was an interesting um, progression. I mean, I went inside the building and my training as a psychologist kicked in and it was like, all right, Candace, you've got to document this mm. because, you know, being trained as a psychologist, you are the ultimate objective observer. You observe everything that goes on. Um, I mean, I can't even remember in graduate school, we would have these, you know, experimental design programs where we would have to design experiments and then come up with hypotheses. And you never figured out what the answer was. You didn't want to know what the answer was. You let the data drive the answer. Hmm. So this training kind of helped me. It's like, I'm going to observe what's going on. I don't know what's going on. You know, I initially I'm going through that checklist. Am I psychotic? And it's like, no, I'm not. I don't know where this is leading. You know, so anyway, I went in my office, sat down and, you know, I'm at my clunky desktop computer and I'm just documenting everything that I can because I knew this was important. I didn't want I didn't want to lose the information. Now, the day was filled with back-to-back meetings and i only had like two or three minutes between each meeting and but i couldn't get this out of my mind Mm. but by the time the end of the day came around i'm thinking you know this is pretty cool i I think i like this Mm. and i I wondered like is this a once in a lifetime opportunity or you know would it happen again well it did happen again it was it was a week or so later Mm. But what happened this time is I started getting messages from people who had passed away. Now, wouldn't you think after just having gone to Monroe Institute, mm-hmm. and here I am, you know, uh, retrieving people, that I would even put two and two together that, oh, people who have passed away are coming to me. It must be related to my experience. No, I didn't put that together, you know, whatsoever. Mm. The first message who or what did you think it came from like a source energy or god or some other being just giving you a message or even a dead person you know the the first message about the tree is like i mean about the the flower it's like i don't know who or what this is from but it was actually good information Mm -hmm. and i liked it and it, it made me start reframing things i started reframing my life through and looking at my life through the lens of energy not right then but that was the beginning of it but then when the messages came in from people who had passed i started learning you know the messages were twofold one would be the message that the person had um for their loved ones and the people that came in i either knew them or knew their family Mm. but i realized they wanted me to share you know, with their loved ones, you know, Mm -hmm. their message, but they were teaching me. They were teaching me about the non-physical world. Um, The first message came in from Becky. 
Becky was a kindergarten teacher who had passed a few years before, and she was a, just a lovely person, you know, a really good friend. And she just came into me and, and told me, again, I don't hear it mm-hmm. with my ears, but it's very spe- a very specific message. But she said that one of our mutual friends, you know, was going to have some health issues, but Becky said, let her know I'm thinking about her, I'm watching her, everything's going to be okay, and for her not to worry. And, you know, the message I got from that is that, you know, when people pass away, they don't change that much. Just as they looked out over over us and watched out over us when they were alive, they still do once they passed over. Mm-hmm. But they have a larger perspective they know what's going to happen or what might happen. Then the next person that came in was someone I called John in the book. He he had a degenerative disease that uh, left him um, very physically impaired and he died in his mid thirties. But, you know, the first thing he said to me was that he had chosen that life. And you know, this is where I had to kind of confront some of my religious upbringing because he started, what he was referring to were sacred contracts Mm -hmm. that before you come to earth, you help design the blueprint for your life. Now, once you're here, you can say, oh, I've changed my mind. I'm not going to take that path. We have free will, but, but there's this blueprint. And John said he had chosen this life. He also said and showed me how he was in complete perfection on the other side. And it's like, okay, that's good. I love it. I I get that. Um, Another one who came in was Robin. And Robin was one of my dear friend's daughter who was brutally murdered by her ex. Mm. Yet Robin forgave him. And I'm thinking, what big heart you must have in order to do that. And she even said, I know people on the other side, you know, won't readily understand that. Mm -hmm. But she forgave him. But the next group that came in, I learned so much. It was from my friend Marilyn. Now, let me tell you about Marilyn. Marilyn is, um, you know, is a good friend of mine. She has her doctoral degree. She's you know, a valid, reliable informant, okay? Her father comes in along with his wife, and then after she had died, he got remarried and his second wife. So here's a man coming in with multiple spouses, Hmm. and I'm thinking, ooh, this is a a little awkward. Yeah. They picked up on that, and I mean, it was clear to see they were a tight knit group. I mean, they were completing each other's sentences. But, um, you know, they said, but we've traveled together for many lifetimes as souls on the same path. So here's another confrontation with my religious upbringing. Um, yeah. I didn't believe in reincarnation. Right. You know, back then I didn't. And if it was in the Bible, which I think it is, uh, we skipped that part. Hmm. You know, so this was new information. Um, well, let me ask choosing you Choosing your, your life. Uh, let me backtrack here. I want to catch this before we get too far ahead. I believe your first one was Becky? Yes. Becky. Now, Becky wanted you to give a message to someone, right? Yes. Uh, did you give that message and if so, how did that person receive that message and how did you feel even giving that message? Well, you know, I think they started off easy because they gave me people that I was comfortable with. You know, this was my very first message mm-hmm. with me being the messenger. Yeah. I called our mutual friend. I had worked with her in a in a school setting and you know, she knew me as a psychologist, so she knew me as being a professional person, someone who really, you know, um, doesn't have flights of fancy. And I just said, I don't know how to tell you this, but, and I just told her. And she was very thankful. Hmm. Um, the same way with when John came in, I didn't know John's 
parents. I knew of them, but I had a mutual friend who happened to be John's parents' best friend. Mm -hmm. So I thought, I can tell her and she can share. Mm -hmm. And so she did. But almost every message that came in, with the exception of one, and I didn't even write about it in the book, I knew these people well enough or through someone else where I could just say what happened. Now, over the years, I have learned that I need to speak my truth. And if what I have to say is does not meet with someone else's um, expectations or guidelines, that's okay. I'm not asking other people to believe me. I just need I just needed to share the information. And as I did, more and more the information was validated. You know, John, for example, had a certain phrase that he would use, and he told me that. Um, you know, Robin said something about, um, she used a phrase, she said, Mary Ludi at the end, and I'm thinking, what on earth does that mean? And as I, when I called um, Robin's mom, Lynn, and, and told her about Robin, I said, does Mary Ludi mean anything to you? And she just laughed. Her best friend's name was Mary Lou, and they used to call her Ludi growing up. But what was happening is, these souls were giving me little tidbits of information that could be verified. And as I verified this, it made me realize that there was truth to the information that I was receiving. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that confirmation. Yes, it was the, the confirmation. I would assume you had some sort of social circle that kind of knew each other. And would they be like, you know, I don't know what's going on with Candace, but she's doing some weird <laughs> stuff now. <laughs> you know, if they felt that way, they didn't share it with me. <laughs> Actually, the opposite was, was true. I, um, you know, I, I started being able to do some healing, some healing energy. Uh -huh. And I can remember once being in a school and the, and the principal, and I, I normally wouldn't even take lunch breaks. I would, you know, bring a sandwich and eat it at my desk. But I, I went to the lunchroom once and the principal of the school was kind of heavy set. And she said, oh, my knees really hurt me. And I said, I can help you with that. And I mean, she didn't even know me. I was, mm -hmm. you know, new at the school. Mm -hmm. And she said, what do you mean? And I explained what Reiki was, mm -hmm. long distance healing. Mm -hmm. Now I had to kind of frame it like, um, well, the Bible talks about laying on of hands. So that made it comfortable for her. But I said, you can do it at a distance. And I said, all I need is your permission. And she said, well, okay. So I worked on her that night. And the next day, she she not only felt better, but the specific pattern of energy that I was using, which just kind of came to me spontaneously, mm -hmm. she felt it. She said, yes, you did this and you did this. and um, But then... She started coming to me later and talking and sharing with me some beautiful spiritual experiences um, that she had never told a soul about, not even her husband. Hmm. So although I started opening up to my truth, um, maybe some of the people that were acquaintances, maybe not friends, but acquaintances probably rolled their eyes at me, which is okay. But there were people that were ready to hear what I had to say. And I started finding myself surrounded by a different set of friends. Hmm. Um, as my beliefs dropped away and I opened to, I think, greater truths, then whatever is within me started shining a different sort of light and it attracted different people to me. Hmm. That makes sense. Have you ever had a message that just shook your foundation, rocked your world, where it just blew you away and you just couldn't stop thinking about it for weeks? Well, it, you know, yes, yes. And um, it's the one that I end this book with. It's called, the last chapter is called In the Beginning. And it was... Um, different from the other messages because this was all experiential 
but I was allowed to see energies that developed in front of my eyes and ended up creating the universe. Now, whether that means it created, you know, Earth or whether it created our galaxy, I have no idea, but it was it was creation of some sort. Hmm. And I was absolutely amazed by it. I am still amazed by it and I still think about it. Um, I had um, I had some really significant back injuries, you know, many, many years ago. Um, I've had multiple spinal surgeries. At one point, I had to use a walker. You know, I couldn't even walk. So, you know, I used to be active and I used to run, but all of a sudden I couldn't do that anymore, but I can walk, that's okay. Well, one day, several years ago, I woke up at two or three in the morning and I had this tremendous amount of energy this happened for about a week and I got up and started running Hmm. now I didn't run then that's why I gave you the background about my 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 injuries but within like three or four days I was running three miles and I mean I'm in my 60s I didn't run and this and you would think especially as a psychologist I know how people have difficulty functioning if they can't sleep. That's one of the key things, you know, how's your appetite, how are, you know, how, what about your sleep habits? I was waking up at two and three, refreshed, going out running, going to work with more energy than I had ever had. I was, I was on point, Uh, you know, you could have given me a hundred things to do and I would have done them just like that, I felt like. And then while I'm running one morning, all of a sudden, this mass of energy starts swirling around me. And I, I ended up seeing what I think is creation. And not knowing what that meant, the messages came to me over a week, um, explaining through different filters what had happened. One was through the lens of religion where it was the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And then I, I got, I, it was explained to me what happened through the lens of science, of black holes that formed and, and stars being born. I learned about gravity wells. I learned about the singularity, all of these topics that I know nothing about until after the fact when I started researching them. But anyway, that's a message um, that to this day still um, I'm still in awe over uh, mm-hmm. to be able to have experienced something like that. Yeah. Would you say that most of your messages come while you're conscious or do you get them in your yes. dreams as well? Well, you know, I do get messages in my dreams. Um, I've kept a dream journal for years. It's like 250,000 words long. And I think that's originally how the messages came to me because I wasn't really ready to hear the messages in my consciousness, you know, waking. But once I um, once I started getting more messages from like, you know, Becky and John and, and Marilyn's family, I realized the messengers, you know, were here, the messengers were here to stay. So I, I had to come up with kind of a routine and they seemed to come to me in that morning commute. So what I would do is I would grab my iPhone, get in the car, buckle up, hit record, and the messages would flow. Hmm. Now, what's so interesting, Jeff, is they were, they were just like dictation. The words were so specific. Um, they would tell me when to start a new paragraph. If I I made a mistake they would actually say strike that and then they would give me the correct word I mean I was thinking oh my gosh I wish I'd had that in graduate school I mean it's like the a spiritual spell check um, if if there was a word I wasn't familiar with I would see I, I would hear how it was pronounced and then I would see the word 
how it would be spelled. But, you know, it was great. All I had to do is just sit back, open, and I would just record it. Every day I would come home, I would listen to my recording, and I would type them up. Um, every once in a while, the messages would arrive at um, inopportune times, like if I'm in the shower getting ready for work, and they would start giving me the messages. You know, it's like they didn't seem to understand or appreciate personal space. And I would just say, whoa, hold off, wait, hold off. And, and they would. But going to work was just this ideal time because I was concentrating enough on my driving, yet open enough to not block the messages from coming. Mm. And then after I got the messages from the people who had passed away, it was like the floodgates opened. And I got messages from the angelic realm. I got messages from religious figures. I got messages from star beings. Um, you know, I haven't read that many books, you know, from people who channel, but what, what little I do know, they seem to have a group or just one person that they channel with. And I was getting different people all, all the time. Well, I can't even call them people, but different energy systems all the time coming in. Mm -hmm. But as long as I just remained open, that energy would flow. And I would wait, record it, and I would not research it until after the fact. Like if a messenger came for several days, it's like I'm not going to look up what they have to say because I don't want to taint future messages. But it's been, um, it's been fascinating. It certainly changed my life. I think it's fascinating that this would happen while you're driving. And maybe you can explain this because just general driving, I'm sure it happens to almost everybody, especially if you drive the same route every day, like you go to work and you come home and sometimes you, you know, you may drive 20 minutes or so, 30 minutes and you're like, wow, I'm already here. I didn't even realize how I got here. It's like you're almost daydreaming and driving at the same time. I don't know if there's a psychological definition of that. And I also wonder is, does your brain become in some kind of meditative state? Because you're a lot of people, I think, including me, would daydream that it would put your, you know, in a, your brain in a certain frequency that you could receive these messages. I think that's exactly what happens. I mean, when I was driving, my, my drive was short, like 10, 12 minute drive. Mm -hmm. It was, it's dark out, there's, there's no traffic, you know, around, but it's like you're on automatic pilot. So your body's taking care of looking at the road and driving, but you're in this state. And, and like, like you say, you know, I've, I've been, I've driven before and it's like, oh, how did I get here? I don't even remember it. But you are in a state of allowing. And that's how the messages, at least for me, would come. You know, energy... When energy comes to you, it's it's like water in a garden hose. If it's crimped, it's not going to flow. But if you allow the flow, then you have a trickle or two. And if you keep allowing it, before long, that, that hose is straightened out, and you're getting more and more. And this is what happened to me. I was getting more messages, and by this time, I was thrilled about it. So I was always grateful. I always said, thank you. Now, I always had discernment. You know, if I had gotten a message that um, that didn't feel right, that I, you know, maybe telling me to do something, and I never had those, but I would certainly use some discernment and say, you know, this is not something I need to pay attention to. But everything that was coming in was um, information, many of, you know, many things I could verify, but, but they were they were great messages. You know, how to enlighten yourself, how to, you know, use your heart to become a better person, how to uplift yourself and people around you. It was, you know, it was great. But I do think being in that state of allowing, you know, we allow during our dreams. In a dream, you can walk through a wall and not think anything of it. Your judgment doesn't say, oh, wait, you can't do that. Well, the same thing is kind of true if you're if you're in that relaxed state, like I was driving to work, I just allowed it to flow and didn't let my ego or judgment prevent it. Have you ever got any messages that were 
from troublemakers or nefarious bad messages? And are you still getting the messages today? Yes, I still get the messages today. Um, I no longer have a commute to work, you know, you who, because I'm, I'm retired, but I would go to meditations or I can actually just sit down and ask for a message and it, it usually comes. I, I typically didn't do that because it felt more authentic if it just came spontaneously. But to answer your first question, I've never had any kind of message that even hinted at something being nefarious or or low-lying energy. I, I did have a message um, that in fact, I first it was my first introduction to the angelic realm. In in real life, there was a person who was who was stalking me, mm. and the message the messengers came in and said that they were putting a shield around me, a protective barrier, to keep me from this person, and that they were actually going to stop my dreams for a while because that person was trying, not trying, but had communicated with me through the dream state. So um, nothing nefarious came, actually the opposite, mm. where I you know, had some extra protection brought in. After all this stuff started happening, did you get any new abilities? Y yes. Um, mm. First of all, my whole life changed. I, my foundation, my, my, the belief systems I had crumbled and like made room for, for larger truths. And I started seeing the world through the lens of energy. And as I did that, I started realizing I could manipulate energy. Mm. So I started some healing. Um, I you know, had known about Reiki, but I was actually able to pull in energy and I see energy when it comes in and I can see how it can affect other people. So I've been able to use, I now have some healing abilities that I didn't have before. I've also learned, again, through the lens of energy, how to manipulate um, my awareness so that I am open to, to visions. Um, many times when I get messages, initially when I got messages, I didn't have um, I really didn't have very many visions because I, I never considered myself to be a visual person. Mm -hmm. But as I continued to connect on the other side, I started realizing that my visualization skills really started to, to ramp up. And I got to the point where if I was sitting down to go to a meditation, I could see energy floating in. Like, for example, usually when the angelic energy comes in, I see these beautiful pastel ribbons of pink and green energy. They look like chiffon scarves that are just floating in slow motion. So when that comes in, I recognize it. That's the angelic realm. Um, I've learned to be much more sensitive. Um, you know how you know the phone rings and you know who it is. Well, those kind of things happen much more frequently to me. Um, I'll, I'll have a dream, I'll have a thought, I'll, you know, something will come to me. And I'm so familiar with my own energy field now, Jeff, that when something comes in, even though it's subtle, I recognize it and I stop. And it's like, oh, where is that from? So instead of just thinking, oh, I just thought of so-and-so the other day, it's like, oh, why is that energy coming to me now? Maybe there's something I need to do with this. Mm -hmm. So then I give the person a call or, or I, I, I act on what it is that, that I see. So I'm much more psychic that way. Um, but basically, my life is just better. Mm -hmm. You know, I realize that I am connected to the other side through my heart. And that's how I'm connected to, to everyone um, in the world. And I know that I'm an energy being and how I use my energy is what defines me and what also defines all of us. I've learned um, 
I'm so much more than my physical body. I'm not this little person who lives on this little earth, you know, in this um, galaxy. There is life after death. I've talked to those people. They are part and we are part of, of consciousness. And we're all moving toward this cosmic consciousness. And it, it's, it's made me realize we are all part of all that is. There is a divine plan. And as little as we might think we are, and as inconsequential as we might think we are, we're not. We are, we are powerful energy beings. I mean, how powerful is it that once you pass away, you can reconnect to your, your family here and help guide them? You know, life goes on and on and on. And it, it came before and before and before this life. We are eternal. Would you classify yourself as a channeler? And would you consider yourself almost being like a near-death experiencer without getting, you know, having yes. any trauma and dying, but you're experiencing it through someone else's death? <laughs> yes, yes. Um, I actually didn't ever use the word channeler, but people kept describing me as a channeler and then I thought well okay I guess I am mm -hmm. I guess I am so I'll accept that that's okay um, but your question about the near-death well let me let me let me piggyback on on that um, the messengers told me and showed me in a vision that when you connect to another energy source then what you do is you lay this energy foundation an electromagnetic I mean I'm not too sure that's probably my interpretation and once you make that connection then you can find your way back to where you are and then you can you can return back back and forth and as you do that you develop this channel that allows you for this clear connection they shared a, a vision with me I was overlooking a bird's eye view I was overlooking this field of wheat at night and there's like a beautiful full moon, a harvest moon. And I'm watching footsteps cross this wheat field. Now, when I say footsteps, Jeff, that's what they were. No body, but actually these steps. And the wheat, the shafts of wheat just started bending and breaking. And so when they reached the other side, you could find your way back easily. You just follow those paths you know, of, of those, you know, those shafts of wheat. But that's how those connections last. And you do develop that channel. So in that sense, yes, I'm a channeler. Hmm. Now, near-death experience, it, it's interesting. I um, was one of the speakers at IANS last month, International hmm. Association for Near-Death Studies. Um, I spoke at one of, at their Durham uh, chapter. And as part of, of preparation for that, I was reading up on IONS, and I discovered that all of these experiences that I had, that there was a name for it. They call them STEs, Spiritually Transformative Events. Mm -hmm. And a near-death experience is a subset of that, so your STE is your larger umbrella. I read a book by Yvonne Kaysen. She used to be a board member at IANS. And uh, she's a medical doctor from Canada and she has had several near-death experiences. But she, in her book, she listed five, six or seven, I don't know, um, characteristics of mystical experiences. And I realized I had experienced all of them. And so much of what's occurred with me is exactly like having a near-death experience without having to die, thank goodness. But, mm -hmm. you know, I feel like right now I am, um, that I straddled this earth. I have one foot firmly planted in three-dimensional reality, but that other foot, and some days it might just be a toe, and other days it might be the whole leg, is in that other dimension. It's in that dimension where we meet guides and angels. It's in that dimension 
where we meet our higher selves, we meet people who have passed on before us, and, you know, I'm getting these beautiful messages about crossing the veil. You know, the, this, on, on my first book, it has a, a long subtitle, An Ordinary Person's Extraordinary Journey into the Unknown. If these things could happen to me without having a near-death experience, Jeff, they could happen to other people. What happened to me, I firmly believe, first of all, part of you know my training as a psychologist did help me stay open, be the objective observer, don't judge, wait till everything has happened and then collect the data and then, then determine it. But, you know, I've gotten these beautiful messages that have told me that Mother Earth, and yes, I use terms like Mother Earth now and Gaia, spirit of Mother Earth, I didn't before, that she is going through a transition. And as she transcends as part of her evolution to higher vibrational frequencies, she brings us along with her, thank goodness. You know, I've got a chapter in this book called Cosmic Contacts where I, I connect with other star systems that have told me they're helping their sister star, our sun, in changing her vibratory frequencies. but. As Earth transcends to higher frequencies, so do we. And that veil between the dimensions is thinning. Now, we all cross that veil at night. We usually, during our dreams, we don't usually remember it. And people that have had near-death experiences all of a sudden wake up and realize they've had this, this transformative event and they know there is life after death. They know that we are much greater than what our physical bodies are. But I've been able to step into that. I have become one, I know this sounds crazy, but I have become one with the universe. I have, I have melted into the cosmic consciousness of all that is. I have become a mite on the wing of a condor as she soars over this earth. I have become part of, you know, a comet zooming through the cosmos. I mean, I have looked back and literally seen with my third eye, and I do say third eye these days, you know, I see our Earth shrinking from view as I zoom out into the consciousness. I have been in meditative states and I look at my hands and I start dissolving and I, I become invisible. I become part of all that is. And what I've learned from all of this is that is who we are. We are not our physical bodies. We are truly unity. We are part of this divine universe that is like this giant machine, but we keep it alive. We're the ones in our little tiny roles that we think. We are, are the nuts and the bolts that keep that machine moving and growing. And people that have had near-death experiences understand this. Um, the messengers have told me about time, literally, and I have a chapter called Father Time, and how time is not linear. It's, it's actually like a sine wave like this. From point A to point B isn't a straight line, and we're like little dots on this line, but as we expand our awareness, what they call a POE, point of existence, then imagine this sine wave and you become this large. Well, all of a sudden, you've included more of your timeline in your awareness. And they've told me that's what happens during a near-death experience. Actually, I can't believe I have this here. This was for an, another talk. It's kind of wrinkled, but this shows 
this is your timeline mm -hmm. that it really is like a sine wave here's your point of existence but as you expand your awareness then you are way out here and that is why and and you not only see the past but also the future and that is one reason why people who have a near-death experience say I looked down and I saw my body is that you're expand you are so expanded but the event or the threat of the event of a near-death experience catapults your point of existence to the outer limits of now your expanded awareness but I'm able to do this and I don't really know why because I'm just an average person, but I'm able to do this in the conscious waking state. Yeah. I mean, I even, and I was talking about Kaysen's talking about mystical experiences. One of the things she said is a mystical experience, people meet up with um, religious figures and they might have healing. When I wrote the second book, The Reluctant Messenger Returns, an unexpected adventure into the angelic realm, it starts off with a medical miracle that I had. I had a paralyzed vocal cord, and I went three months after my surgery that did this, uh, a thyroidectomy, I went to a specialist who scoped my throat, said, your vocal cord's paralyzed, we need to do surgery, and I said, I'll call next week. I couldn't talk, I had to wear a microphone in a voice box, I said, I'll call next week. I went to Monroe Institute, and during a meditation, I saw Buddha. Now, this is before any of, this is before Lifeline or anything that had happened. Mm -hmm. And Buddha wasn't even on my radar. That's why I knew it didn't come from me. And he said, be silent for 24 hours, and you will be healed. Mm -hmm. And I honored that. 24 hours later, my voice returned spontaneously. Mm -hmm. It was a documented medical miracle. Five months later, I go to Lifeline and get the practice through, you know, retrieving people. And two weeks later, I opened a spirit. That's why I say this book tells about the how it happened. This book explains the why um so i kind of got on a tangent there but oh that's okay um, my life is my life is just um i am so changed mm -hmm. um fr from my opening i just i love it no i think it's great are you working on a third book or do you have any other projects that you're working on that you want us to know about I started working on, on a third book. Um, when I could no longer go to um, meditations, I would do that, you know, uh, after COVID hit. Mm. You know, after COVID hit, I didn't do that anymore. I started going to meditations after I retired and I would get these beautiful messages. But now that I'm pretty much sticking at home, um, I thought, okay, I need to just sit down at the computer and ask questions. So I started book number three, which is The Reluctant Messenger conversations within i just ask a question and they give me the answers but i've been so busy doing other things lately that I, i've really kind of pushed pushed that you know to the side mm -hmm. and by the way writing a book was never my idea the messenger said you'll be writing this book and i'm saying no i'm not yes you are mm -hmm. and I, I ended up writing it because they said they would help me but um you know, other things I'm doing, I, I'm pretty big on social media. I, you know, I've got a Twitter account, Facebook, LinkedIn. I've got a website, CandaceSanderson.com. I just started an, an Instagram, you know. I've got, a, I've got, gosh, Jeff, I've got three YouTube channels now, wow. which is crazy. One, just in my name, Candace Sanderson, I have, you know, 80 or 90 videos on it. And I'm very... Um, uncomfortable with doing things like that but I knew I had to do it and then I've got another channel that's called spiritual conversations 
I've got 20, 21 um, videos there. I have conversations with my friend, Carrie Palmer. She's a radio personality in Seattle. She read my book and connected with me. We've been friends ever since. And then my, my newest YouTube is um, The Reluctant Messenger Unleashed. I did a podcast with Donna Rebido. She has um, Exploring Consciousness website, I mean, uh, podcast. And she was so, she started connecting with me over social media when I was going to be your guest. And she was saying, oh, page 14, oh, page 27, oh, look at this, look at that. And I figured she was, she probably said that to everybody, but that she interviewed, but she didn't. So she is now hosting this Reluctant Messenger, or The Reluctant Messenger Unleashed. We've only just released the third um, episode, but it's like a, a book club. We are going through page by page the messages, the messages and unleashing the truth behind it. So those are the things I'd like people to know about. But what I really want people to know about is you really matter, you know. Um, you, I, I know as a psychologist, the holidays are coming up and these holidays are so different this year than they've ever been. And even during good times, you know, there's a lot of people out there that don't do the holidays well. They get depressed. And, you know, I just want people to know that there is light at the end of the tunnel. You know, you you do matter. You are an energy being and there is a divine spark that lives within you that is part of this magnificent world. And don't ever think that that you're inconsequential because you're not. You are powerful. Bring in good energy. Smile. You know, if you feel rotten, you know, we all have those days. Just smile. And when you force a smile, within a few seconds or minutes for some of us, that smile becomes genuine. But what it does, it literally lifts your vibrations. It lifts your energy. And as it does that, then you start glowing, literally, because I can see that. And you, you put forth this beacon for other people to come and connect with you, whether it's on Zoom or on social media. So be kind to yourself these, this holiday season and know how important you are. I think that's a great message. Candace, before we wrap it up here, do you engage with the public on your Facebook or your Twitter? And if so, if you can remember them, do you want to give those to us so people can find you? Well, um, my website is CandaceSanderson.com. Mm -hmm. On Twitter, well, you know, actually, if you just go on Google and you type Candace with an I, Sanderson, mm -hmm. you'll see, and you do videos, you'll see, you'll see my um, YouTube. And if you go on any of my YouTube channels, I have a link below to all of my social media. And I have so many people that reach out to me. Mm -hmm. um, and I've always gotten back to every single person. So if you need to connect with me, you can, you can connect through my social media and I will certainly reply. Uh, I've got like 8,000 followers on Twitter, um, but you can find me and I will re I will respond. Oh, that's great. All right, Candace, I really appreciate you giving me some of your time today. I wish you massive success with your books. And when you have your next book come out, maybe we can have you back and we can talk about it. That sounds wonderful. Thank you so much, Jeff. This was great. Thank you. Have a great evening. You too. Bye-bye.